Welcome, book lovers, to another edition of our monthly book club. I am joined alongside Marissa Serafini, and we are talking about The Legend of Bagger Vance, which is now a major motion picture, according to the cover. But it is actually true. So uh, this is a book written by Stephen Pressfield in 1995. We'll get into all the history. We'll break it down. We'll get into all the various spoilers. Uh, the themes and so forth. But uh, before we do all that, let's start with overall impressions. Let's go ahead to you, Marissa. Okay. Well, I admit I was hesitant to read this book because golf is like my least favorite sport. <laughs> I always joke that golf is boring. Um, personally, I mean, like it's subjective. It were, oh, like we all know this, but like I personally find golf super boring to watch. And then I was like, oh, great. Now I'm going to read a book about golf. And this book just pretty much reinforce the fact that golf is still boring uh so i'm glad the movie and we'll definitely get into it i'm glad the movie made it i think more interesting but this book if you wanted to like golf and you read this book it's not going to help you with that uh so yeah honestly i thought this book was painful but we'll get <laughs> to it <laughs> Yes. Well, uh, you need to rewatch Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the 1990 version where Casey Jones gets a baseball club and uh, uses it. And then he's like, I never call golf a dull game again. <laughs> Anywho, we digress. Uh, <laughs> great movie. Great movie. But uh, for me, so I am familiar with Stephen Pressfield, mostly through his nonfiction stuff. I mean, The War of Art is seminal for pretty much any artist that like is really trying to break through. Um, but he's also got a, other works as well, you know, do the work and uh, things of that nature, which I've dived in on. But all of that is possible because he has a literary career through his fiction. And he'd been working um, for a number of years as a writer and a screenwriter. And like his history is just fascinating. And he'd written so much throughout his life, but none of it like made it, right? And mm -hmm. so Legend of Bagger Vance actually was the first thing that was like, boom, okay, you know, we actually like this. So um, so that kind of started his whole trajectory in like his second half of life, where now he's, uh, you know, I mean, he's a very accomplished author um, in many ways, but this was like the book. And so I said to myself, well, let me actually read what he's written as far as fiction because i'd never done that you know and this seemed like the logical choice um and yes you know uh i, th I think to me going into it like um just based on knowing what i knew about the movie because i knew it was a movie it stars will smith and matt damon and uh, charlize their own so i was like it it kind of feels like the sandlot of golf or like the forest gump of golf which is you know like this kind of feel good mm -hmm. sort of aspect to it so I was like, okay, you know, this could be warm and nice. Um, and I got to say, this is one of those rare instances where the movie is far superior than the book. Far superior. <laughs> so uh, let's, yeah, I guess let's just crack open that door. Marissa, hit me with it. You want to do bullet points? You want to go in detail? However you prefer, go. About the book or the movie? <laughs> we'll start I so with much the book. rather talk about the movie. Let's um, let, we'll start with the book yeah. and then we'll talk about why the movie is superior. Okay. Yeah. Well, all right. I think the you know me. I'm a creative. I'm an artist. I'm not great with numbers. <laughs> and so when we get into the competition, oh, overall, like this book was about this big competition, this big get together of famous golfers in the, you know the prime past prime whatever just like gathering these guys who are known for golfing um but once we get to the competition and the actual description of every time they hit the freaking ball and like it went 40 meters that way and like with this much wind and like there there was like millions upon millions of different measures of units of distance whatever and it lost me so much and that was multiplied by five guys and i i just couldn't i couldn't keep up with it <laughs> um so when i was like reading every single time they they were up to i was gonna say bad <laughs> but you know well, like when it was their turn to you know hit the ball and like oh my god i don't know it's just like it i i i question if pressfield like if he thought being very descriptive 
in the technical aspect of the golf and like all the things that go with it um, would make it more interesting. Nah, I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it did. I, it just turned my brain off even more um, and reinforced that golf is still boring. Um, so I had problems with the competition and just reading the um, it, it's just like, I don't know, it just didn't resonate with me. Um, for me to follow these guys and still want to keep my interest in following these guys for three days and all these holes. I'm like, uh, psh, I don't know. It, it wasn't for me. Um, I, the characters, I, uh, I mean, we, we had um, the, the, the woman, like the only woman amongst all the guys, uh, Adele. But like she didn't come into the story until like 200 pages into the book. Like we're we're like two thirds of the book already over. And then she finally comes in as some estrogen, much needed estrogen. I was like, Oh, I wish we saw her more. <laughs> um, and I'm glad that the movie covers that a lot more. Um, I don't know. I just, I didn't like the characters. I didn't like the story. I didn't like, I mean, there's, there's so much of this book. I didn't like. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it has, it has the underpinnings of something great. Like, you know, I mean, regardless, I think sports competition, you know, novels or movies can be very successful, right? I mean, you kind of know ultimately where that genre is going and you kind of know that you're in for a feel good, right? And that's what you want out of these movies, um, regardless right. of it's, if it's predictable or not. And, you know, this is set in the Depression era, post-World War One. So Juna, uh, one of the main characters, you know, that's what he's kind of grappling with is you know how to continue life and so golf becomes um the thing that brings him back which you know he's the reluctant hero he has to get pushed into it mm -hmm. and uh bagger vance is this mystical character who guides him along and our main character is the witness to it all and he's changed irrevocably by this experience right and that's kind of where and so for me like i i was interested there, there's a uh, early on they're on the golf course and you know they're they're kind of stepping they're measuring out the the golf course itself be the night before because you know they like to do it themselves as opposed to trusting uh you know other people to have done it and they get into a philosoph philosophical debate about the authentic swing and i was like okay this is interesting and it was interesting for about the first three four five pages and then the rest of the book become like, in a way, to me, the respites were the golf because I was like, OK, enough with this philosophy stuff. Like it was very like it highlights that he's a to me, it seems like he's a much better just judging purely off this. He's a much better nonfiction writer than a fiction writer, because mm -hmm. that's what this really was. It was like, we'll give you some sprinkled in narrative stuff, but really it's a philosophy book, you know? Agreed. And I kind of maybe this shows my millennial mentality. Um, <laughs> I, I kind of saw Bagger Vance as like the Mary Poppins of golf, like comes in, lets the lets him know about his personal issues. This is what you need to work on. Let's find it. Let's get you back to your true self, your authentic swing, get you back to that state and where you used to love golf, blah, 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 blah. And then once, quote unquote, Juna found that again. He he found his rhythm again. He found the reason why he wants to continue his life. And then he leaves. Very much like Mary Poppins. Like, hey, I did my job. All right, you don't need me anymore. Bye. Um, so it kind of it created Bag Vance as the golf version of Mary Poppins. And then also the authentic swing. I kind of <laughs> again showing my millennial age. This is how I grew up. Don't mind me. Uh I <laughs> again I equated it to the Goofy movie, maybe oh, a lot of Disney influence. Um, the Goofy movie, okay, <laughs> let's see with, where this goes. with you know, Goofy saying, "Hey, the perfect cast." You know, like there's a perfect way to do it, and once you got it, then you like nailed it. Um, so I kind of read authentic swings, like, "Hey, it, it's gonna take you a while, but once you get it, then like you're good, you're set. You you know, like you have all the principles. You you know the philosophical." aspect of it is like you, you got to work up to it um yeah. so i don't know it's like i get it it's like you got to work yourself to a certain level but it, if it was like try to get 
yourself back to who you used to be or like remember who you are or where you came from, that was a very long winded way of getting there. Yeah. And obviously, I mean, listen, you know, sort of it's kind of this journey to enlightenment, right? Which is not an, a simple path by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah. But it, 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 there was just a lot of stuff in there. Um, like they had a whole history that we didn't know about. Um, and even Bagger Vance is kind of very mysterious where people ask him, like, where did you come from? Do I know you? And he's like, we've met in a prior lifetime. And like just random stuff like that, that you're like, OK, that some of it goes somewhere, others of it not. Um, I guess this is as good as an opportunity as ever. Let me just kind of also say that this was very much inspired by the uh, Hindu epic, and I'm going to butcher a lot of this, so I apologize in advance. Um, the Hama Bhattarata. Um, apologies for clearly not saying that correctly, but uh, the plot is based uh, loose, basically on. Um, uh, Bhagavad Gita. Oh, the Bhagavad so Gita. Yeah, I actually yeah. have that book. Yeah, but I, obviously I haven't read it, but it's actually a big book in the Western culture about philosophy, enlightenment, and all big speakers now who are like big into meditation, like Deepak Chopra, um, Jay Shetty, who I've been following before all you actually knew who he was. Like they all, well, like some of their favorite book is actually the Bhagavad Gita. So that makes sense. Well, uh, so maybe you have read it because this is very much inspired by that. So uh, the warrior hero, Ajaruna, J uh, Jonah, you know, that, that was his, he refuses to fight. Uh, the god Krishna appears as uh, Bhagavan, Bhagavans, uh, to help Ajaruna follow the path of the warrior and hero that he was meant to take. So, um, you know, that's the jumping off point for the legend of bagger Vance. and uh yeah i mean overall i think it's just there's a lot going on and if anything i appreciate the movie obviously a movie has to do this but it just simplified things so much like just starting with a simple thing of he didn't have a brother right the main character that's retelling all of this and, and that's what it is in both the movie and the book is that there's this older person and he's recounting, you know, this thing that had happened years ago. Um, now how they get into it is completely different. Um, I actually like the movie version. I don't know if, if there's like one downfall to the movie, it's just funny that it opens up with him on a golf course, having his fifth heart attack. Like this happens <laughs> a lot. <laughs> no, Let me tell I, you about but... Bagger Vance. I, I got to admire that because that actually made me laugh. I was like, Jack Lemon had the easiest job in this movie. Like, legit, he hits a ball once, he, he falls down on the ground and lays there for two hours, and then he gets back up and walks away. Like, and then he got a paycheck. That, that's the easiest job. I'm like, come on, I just signed me up for an actor. That's like what it takes to be uh, a legend. Um, no, I did love that. And, and, and you know, it's good because it kind of shows like he this character has loved golf so much literally through life threatening um moments in his life he's still gonna play golf he's gonna play golf literally until the day he dies and that's why i drew the uh sandlot example because that's very much a, a retrospect on like you know the glory days of baseball and then you know he kept baseball part of his life where you know, he's not playing it, but he's a commentator for Jenny, uh, Benny the Jet Rodriguez, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. But. Um, I, I did like how they, because I, I think I understood it better, babe, uh, like better um, through the movie, especially like the young Hardy Graves um, showing, because you mentioned like he doesn't have a brother. It also just like establishes the fact he doesn't have a lot of male influence in his life. And so at a young age, when he sees young guys being successful, someone like Juna, um, he, he's going to cling on to that. He's like, hey, that's that's a male figure that I can look up to and I can like emulate and um, be inspired by. And I think that's why he latched on to Juna so much and the legacy. And then how Bagger Vance helped shape Juna to be the golfer that Hardy Greaves saw him as. Yeah, and that was a big distinction, right? So in in the novel, it is Hardy who has to like go and tell the good news to Jonah. But in the movie, 
it's actually Hardy who comes up with the idea of like, hey, why not Juna? Mm -hmm. Which I thought was a much better decision to make where it gives agency to Hardy and it gives him a reason to go and essentially fetch Juna, you know? Yeah, and it shows that even though he's a kid, he still knows better. He he knows quality rather than... Um, because, you know, like he's a kid, people aren't going to take him seriously. But the fact that he knows iconic players, he knows the game, he loves the game more than anything else, um, it, it actually makes him credible when a young kid is um, suggesting Juna instead of the, the adults who should be suggesting him. Exactly. And, uh, you know, that scene... The way that they kind of had met, you know, for the very first time, seemingly, um, was a great scene. I mean, in the book, it's sort of short and it, it and it and it works, but I liked how the movie handled it and really extended it, where, you know, he's playing with them and so forth, and uh, mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, kind of just really sees him drunk and so forth, and kind of confronts it head on, and and that's where it's not the first time we meet Adele, but it's certainly one of the first times that uh, Hardy really meets adele adele uh yeah and I, you know i like it when it's told through a kid's perspective but like especially the, the way that they used it because like yeah now he's he's literally injecting himself into an adult place adult he's surrounding by drunk adults and stuff he's but he's a very precocious kid and he's wiser than he should be and like that's why I did, you know, in, overall enjoyed like the purpose of of Hardy Grease getting Juna back into the literally the swing of things. Um, but it, it's it's nice to see like an age difference because I think if Juna was trying to be convinced by other guys his age, he would immediately say no. But when it came from the innocence and um, genuineness of a kid looking up to him, I think that's like what clicked in Juna like. Ah, uh, maybe he sees something in me that others don't. And that's what got Juna back into it. Yeah, and, and this is where, you know, he kind of gets that, he's got that spark where he's like, okay, let me just hit some golf balls, right? Like, I haven't committed to anything. Let me see if I even have the swing, right? Pun mm -hmm. intended. And, uh, you know, that's when we meet Bagger Vance for the first time in the movie, which is vastly different from the book and i really appreciated that bagger vance you know is that mary poppins type of character now people have kind of criticized the movie for being a magical negro uh storyline but it's i don't know i hmm. i i i appreciate yeah the mary poppins aspect of it all i appreciate it like this mystical f figure coming into your life when you need it most like i don't know i think we all yeah. need that <laughs> i think we do and i think that's that's why I like the the purpose of Bagger Vance is like he came in, he did his job and he knew like and he was very honest and up, up front. He's like, hey, I'm going to do this for you. I, I'm not really asking for anything in return, but like I, I I'm going to help you because you need help. And I know you're not going to ask for it, but I'm the kind of person who's going to help you. And then once you're done, I, like my job is done and I can just leave and like off to my merry ways. Um, and th that was the purpose of Bagger. Like he came in, did a job and left. Yeah. And um, and I, I really like that interaction with them um, in that moment. And and eventually, you know, Juno kind of finally decides he's going to do this. And boom, we're we're sort of off to the races, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, you know, and. Yeah, the first bit. It, it, I mean, it just lends itself much better to kind of seeing, you know, and whereas the book kind of elongates these anecdotes the movie you know you can just spend a little bit of time with it you know a two minute scene a three minute scene whatever it is and just have it be sort of about one thing without it really dragging but in the book it's just repeated so many times and it's just like okay you're it's a law of diminishing returns here right you know? like so. you're hitting a ball <laughs> over and over and over and over and over again how many times did that happen at 56 64 i don't know i forget <laughs> Yeah, there. I mean, there's what I mean. I, we should know. I I think it was um, I can't do math again. Well, it was I'm a not three day tournament. It was a three day event, um, eighteen holes. So eighteen times three. Do the math. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm not gonna do the math. We we should know because like we read it. But um, I think it's just like me personally. I I was like I never 
was interested in golf. It's not my demographic. It's not like what I grew up with. I always equate golf as a rich person's sport. <laughs> like you people who are very wealthy, who very well to do, um, usually like business people, CEOs, the people who have money and the time to go to a golf course and hit balls and do business for hours on end. Um, I was never within that category. <laughs> and so when we see these guys, you know, playing golf, like if they're all in the, like the same tax bracket, <laughs> they're all they're the same kind of people. And I, I just, I couldn't relate to it. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, it is interesting. And that's why I think with the movie, right. Um, Adele, I think it plays a very big part of it because I mean, she's certainly not, <laughs> not poor. She's very well yeah. off. Yeah. She's the one who put this whole thing together. Um, but I think she's our connection to a more humane side of all this. Whereas in the in the book, um, Jonah, I mean, he's kind of a womanizer. I mean, you know, in, in the movie, Hardy almost sees something happen. But in the yeah. book, he sees not only one thing happen, he sees two things happening at the same time. So interpret as you will. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that just shows uh, Juno, his, his state, um, where he is in life. It's just like, obviously, war torn, kind of lost who he is. He find he's literally six pleasure wherever he can get it immediate, you know, that instant gratification kind of. And I mean, he's a young guy in like, what, 20s, 30s. Um, so like, not <laughs> far from what a guy would be acting his age Uh Unfortunately for Hard to Grieve, see, he kind of got like a taste of that. <laughs> um, but again, and I like that's why I liked Adele because she did add that female perspective. And yes, this is part of the Great Depression. And I think the movie touched up on it a little bit better that like the the whole country is financially struggling. But we are a community that still has money and we're still going to play golf. We're still going to gather all the richest people together to enjoy this game that we all love. And there's still going to be a big money prize. Like they couldn't care like any less about um, the rest of the people and the people who are actually still financially struggling. They're like, we're still rich. So we're still going to play a rich game. Yeah. I, that bothered me. That really bothered me. I mean, that's certainly what um, movie wise Hagen really represented um, was this because he even speaks to Juna and was like, hey, when this is done, like, let's continue these exhibitions. Like, I don't even do competitions. I just do exhibitions. You know, I'll, of course, win, but we'll split the money. You'll get 30%. I'll get 70%. And, you know, nice, easy chunk of change. And that was one of the first sort of moments where uh, Juna kind of gets confronted about a higher morality, right? Like, you know, that doing something like that like that's not why he's doing this he's doing it for a more noble cause if you want to call it that um and so you know i felt that was a a good addition to it all and and, and that movie wise it was really hagen who was the smoker the drinker the womanizer and mm -hmm. you know he had he i i like the voiceover line of like listen he didn't have to play good he just had to have one stroke um, per round right. to, to, you know, be okay and be in the races. So. Yeah. It's like for every three bad hits, he had one good one that would make up for it. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. And, and I'm like, and that's the thing with all these guys that, that we like all the players, like, I didn't really like them. I'm like, all right. Yeah. You're good at golf, but what else are you good at? <laughs> and then, um, but like, I liked Adele's motivation. Like I kind of loved hated. Adele's motivation where it's like she didn't being the only female um she didn't get the respect or, or amongst the peers amongst the men um they're like hey you, yeah you come for money but you don't have your father's legacy you have his business yada da 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 um so she's kind of doing it to establish credibility it's like hey I can run with you guys um I can run a successful business doing the exact same thing you guys are doing so like I get why like there's that business aspect she has and why she brings everybody together but also th just the fact that she's trying to prove herself is also really annoying um because she shouldn't have to prove herself to still be successful 
And uh, so that's why I, I like I loved hated it. I liked her because she is so a good character and good balance and foil to to all the men. Um, otherwise, this would have just been a sausage party. <laughs> so uh-huh. like me being the woman reading the book is nice to see another woman in the story. Yeah, and I, you know, ultimately one of the things I do appreciate about kind of the the, the whole story is, um, I don't know, it's a very kumbaya sort of moment at the end where everyone sort of learns something, right? And their heart, mm-hmm. mo- you know, and obviously not Hagen's not going to be all this like noble character, but just the idea that overall they were affected by this experience and changed at least a little bit for the better. And I will say one of the better parts that I did appreciate was when Jonah um, really went in on Hardy and was like, Hey, your dad, like, cause there was that moment where Hardy was really down on his dad as essentially being a bum um, because, you know, they were affected by the depression and Jonah hits back at him and says, Hey, ultimately he actually paid off all of his debt, paid all the people that he needed to, and isn't mooching off the system. He's doing what he can. And just because he's now a street sweeper, He's, you know, he's doing it to get by and not being a lazy bum like all, all your other friends, you know, that are just victims of circumstance. And so in that sort of weird cyclical way, you know, his father was a motivation to Jonah. Right. Right. Um, I, rem- I did like that. And that kind of reminded me of Water for Elephants. You know, when we had the main character, he didn't have any financial inheritance because he learned that his parents, his father was actually a good guy. He wasn't in it for the money. He was in it just to help people. Um, so and we, we got it with uh, Juno's father that like, hey, instead of like selling out, um, he was actually he stuck to his morals and, and and helped people financially and stuff. And even if that made him financially, you know, um, poor in that way. So it's like the and and that's even a distinction between the wealthy and the poor. Um, the fact that like he was willing to be poor mostly just because he was a good guy. Yeah. And obviously rather unfortunate. Hopefully, uh I don't think they touch upon it ever, but you know, hopefully uh Juna gives Hardy some money <laughs> for all. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> for all, you know, um, Bagger Vance only wanted five dollars guaranteed, but uh, you know, out of ten thousand yeah, dollars, you know, that ten percent should have gone to a little bit. Should have gone to Greaves <laughs> for no. like finder's fee, you know, <laughs> <laughs> something, uh, something, <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, what else do you want to kind of? touch upon whether book or movie wise i mean i think we got the uh the broad strokes pun intended on that <laughs> pun one intended. very nice nice indeed um, um i think the movie did a better job of getting into the mind of this is why i play golf not like not the technical aspects of this is what's happening when i play golf but this is why um especially during the scene i don't know i'm such a visual learner (laughs) and i i I read better when it's visual um the scene where he's in the forest literally in the thick of things uh in the trees he's surrounded by everything that's like set up for failure but he sees the very small opening like hey i can do that um i can hit the ball through that and be successful um i think it really just shows like hey even though you're surrounded by so much shit you can find the good and still be successful. And you know, like me, I, I don't know how is the best word to <laughs> best way to word it, but it's just like, uh, even though you're struggling, doesn't mean that you can't come out, you know, on top or you, you know, like it, it, you're, you won't be like a failure. Like you can still be successful in that way. Does that yeah. make sense? I, I mean, it is. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, the, the authentic swing is essentially synonymous with the authentic self. Right. Um, and that's right. why, you know, towards the end where Jonah has his ball and he accidentally moves it, you know, because he's trying to clear a path for it. And, you know, little Hardy is begging him, like, please don't do this. Like, we're the only two people that saw this. No one's going to say anything. And then what's funny is, you know, even like his competitors are like, no, like, it's all good. Like, he probably just imagined it. Like, they're trying to give him a way out despite his honesty. And he's like, no, I can't accept that the ball moved therefore 
you know, you have to right. add another point or, you know, another, all that. Yeah, stroke or something. But like, and I think that was a moment I was like, all right, Juna is actually a true player. Um, like he really does respect the game enough to be that honest because, yeah, we saw him struggle throughout the entire competition, but also, um, and now he's like so close to winning, but he's authentic and genuine about it and honest about it with the integrity of, hey, I moved it. Um, if this makes me lose, then I'm okay with that, knowing that I did the right thing. Um, and for character wise, I liked Juna for that. Yeah, I mean that that to me, like that that was the whole moment, right? The climax of where it's like he, he's now himself again, right? Regardless mm-hmm. of what happens, um, you know, obviously he's a great golfer, but he, he is now a genuine human being. And that's what matters most. And, you know, then he got his dance with uh, Adele <laughs> and so forth. And, yeah. you know, it was, it was a feel good ending. It really was. So it I was. Think. And I liked how it also established that Juno wasn't in it for the money. He was just in it to find himself again. Yeah. And that's why uh, Bagger Vance even left early. He's like, hey, you got this kid. <laughs> yeah, it's like, you're good. I, th- I was like, we got you there. You're fine. Now you don't need me anymore. Yeah, job's done. You know, mm-hmm. and then uh, he hears the cheering from uh, from the beach, and yeah, that was it. He's so. like, yeah, "My job is done." Yeah, so I thought, yeah, again, movie very rarely happens. The Prestige is the <laughs> other one that comes to mind that is uh, a yeah. far better movie than a book, but uh, you know, it does happen. So um, this is one of those examples. You know, definitely my recommendation would be just watch the movie. <laughs> just watch the movie. Yeah, I'd like to say watch the movie and forget that the book even exists. <laughs> yeah. So, but uh, but hey, all the same, listen, I am thankful that uh, at least the book did propel a movie and it propelled Stephen Pressfield's writing career. Um, again, I've not read his other fiction, but his nonfiction certainly top notch. So I can appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Um, So everything serves a purpose. And before we wrap out, um, let's talk about things we've been reading outside of our homework. So I guess I'll go (laughs) first. Um, I've been reading the school for good and evil book number one, which Ah. this is like a whole basically Harry Potter esque type series. You know, it's a fantasy um, and mm-hmm. stuff like that. And I, I heard a lot of good stuff about it. Um, there is a Netflix movie, which I hear is yes. atrocious. Um, that's what I hear. I haven't watched it, so I don't know. But um, I heard I'm mixed much, things about it. Yeah, I'm much more interested in the book. And uh, I'll just read the summary real quick. Uh, this year, best friends Sophie and Agatha are about to discover where all the lost children go. The fabled school for good and evil, where ordinary boys and girls are trained to be fairy tale heroes and villains. So that's... I mean, there's more to the summary, but that's the basic okay. gist. And that sounds uh, fun to me. So I'm not that far in, right. but uh, so far it's an easy, like literally it's like the level of Harry Potter, the first book, as far as like it's hard accessibility. So. <laughs> uh, quite honestly, I haven't read uh, any books since our last book. Um, it's been for us a shorter turnaround than normal. Um, so I've, I've just been busy, but I do, of course, have my to be read books and I do have a book. Here, what's it called? Uh, the Edge know, of the World. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm actually propping my camera on top of the book. Um, girl, girls at the edge of the world. Um, it is an LGBTQ story, uh, and I'm like, I love to support, you know, queer authors, queer stories because I think we definitely need more exposure to that. So that's um, that's next on my my list. Very cool. Things I'm considering. Um... And by the way, I throw this out there in case anyone's ever read these. Let me know what we thought. The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian by Sherman Alexi. Um, Carpentaria by Alexis Wright. Oh, Carpentaria. Yeah. Have you read that? Is it good? No, but I've definitely heard of it. All right. Well, that's on my list. Uh, Monkey Beach by Eden Robinson. So those are the ones that I'm looking at at some point. Um, and just a recap of what we've got coming up. We've got Skipping Christmas. Uh, no, we're not actually Skipping Christmas. That is the name of the book. Um, yep. It's also been turned into a movie called Christmas with the Cranks, which I had not seen. 
which I didn't know until I after after I read the book. The book is fun. Um, so it's lighthearted, get us into the Christmas spirit. And then um, in January, we have Marissa's pick. Um, yeah, we have anxious people. Uh, I am a person who suffers from anxiety, but it's it's fun when you read other people <laughs> about, you know, and when you're put into situations and how people deal with it. So this will be our January 2024 pick. It's supposed to be light, funny, witty, all that. So like, yeah, I joke about anxiety, but it's like when you get a group of, you know, people like a lot of different people and you throw them all together you know, complete strangers, you know, craziness is going to ensue. And I like, I'm a sucker for that. Well, and that should be a good way to kick off the year. And then uh, just in time for uh, Valentine's day, not very on theme, um, the earth of mankind. So this is about a young Javanese student uh, during the colonization of by the Dutch and so forth. And this book is a uh, sort of controversial. It's actually, uh, it was, you know, um, the author had written a lot of his works from prison. So, uh, you know, it's actually banned in a lot of uh, places. And who knows the way the U.S. is going. It might be banned here soon, too. <laughs> um, we That means we need to read and talk about it before it gets banned. So, um, yeah, uh, you know, it's uh, I definitely have a coloni colonizer sort of theme to a lot of the books that we read. <laughs> you do. You really do. I mean, uh, I wasn't going to say it, but. <laughs> but it's also like, I want to, yeah, overall, like I want to read books from various authors around the globe. And unfortunately, a lot of them have been colonized. So mm -hmm. a lot of them write about that experience. Go right. figure. <laughs> you know, so. Right. Yeah. I just love, I love reading fiction, <laughs> you know, like sci-fi fiction, regular fiction, romance fiction, you know, fiction, because I find that escapism. <laughs> Eventually, so. I want to do the hard thing and try to at least read some of Dune. But we'll uh, see. I did try reading Dune and I did not finish it. I got to try again. <laughs> yeah. So it's a long book. <laughs> I hear it's a, yeah, I just want to read at least like a section of it. I forget how it's broken down into parts and stuff like that. Like, I just want to read at least eight parts. <laughs> yeah. There you go. So. How about like you and I, we need to keep it each other accountable to finish it that's an attainable goal sure but it's also i heard it's like i, mean, it, <laughs> I it's, hear your enthusiasm well because it's it's a you know it's like this 800 page book um mm -hmm. which all things considered i mean lord of the rings and even like infinite just is longer but from what i understand infinite just is far more <laughs> enjoyable than dune <laughs> Uh, yeah. And, well, like I, I said, I tried before and I and I couldn't finish it. So I, I know the struggle already. <laughs> yeah. So at some point, who knows? Maybe that'll like be our collective book club. <laughs> book. Anyway. All right. As always, comment. Let us know what you're reading, what you'd like us to read. And uh, also, yeah, just about the stuff that we've been doing um, so far. I mean, we've been at this a, a while. So we've got quite a number of books for, you, you know, our literal library library for you to yeah. check out so it keeps growing keeps building which is uh cool you know when we started this it was just one book and we didn't know and now we're we're here we're two years in yep we just keep reading we just love books so awesome uh at serafini tv for marissa if you want to keep up with her at phil svitek we'll see you next time mm -hmm.